been great hearing from all of you about you know the bits of history you've been involved in and, and the bits even before that. But I guess the, the big question is, where's it going next? I mean, I bet Helen and Al Free had no idea that we'd still be using the technology that they developed on the scale we're using it now. But what's what does the future look like for your analysis, do you think? We've relied on urine testing for literally thousands and thousands of years as humans. Who knows what the future will bring? Who knows what tests, what mysteries are still hidden within urine that we haven't discovered yet? You know, urinalysis has been around for a long time, but that does not mean that we know everything we need to know about it. There is a long way to go, especially because there's a lot more that your urine actually has than we actually detect today. I think being able to collect all that information is very critical. Given the amazing developments that have happened in this space already over so many thousands of years, I think it's really exciting when you take a, take a pause and think, well, if it's come this far over that many thousands of years, what's going to keep happening in this field going forward? We're here in Elkhart, Indiana, and community was at the core of what was done here to invent modern urinalysis and then also to produce it on a mass scale. We're still thinking about community today. Uh, the whole deployment of urine testing and the, the goal really is to equip healthcare providers at a community level, the local governments, to get the baseline patient data quickly and conveniently to understand what is happening in a certain population so that they can then perhaps affect policy decisions uh, or really uh, targeted campaigns to make sure that they're pursuing early treatment and prevention of a certain disease state. Chronic diseases are, have been on the rise worldwide, but substantially more in the, on, on the rise in, in emerging markets or in underserved populations you know, all over the world. So the value of these protein creatinine dipsticks is that in a setting where you don't have access to laboratory testing, uh, it can be done anywhere in the various economies of the world. In almost all these places, people have access to, you know, phones or connected devices. So the ability to communicate, you know, with somebody who isn't necessarily local. You went to a doctor to get tested, and the doctor was 100 miles away, either you didn't go and get tested, or it took you four days to get there, or two days to get there to get tested. So overwhelmingly, you didn't get tested, right? Now, that barrier, as, I'm not saying it's gone away completely, but it's severely diminished. Now the question is, how do you get tests there? Point of care is perfect for that because the tests are easy to use. They could be used in remote locations and the scale of them is just massive. I'm very interested in, in advancing human health and really bringing quality healthcare to people around the world. In recent years, people have taken charge over their health, their wellness, and I think people demand more from their health provider than ever before. But that doesn't start in a hospital, or that doesn't start even, even very often in a doctor's office. That starts away, that starts at a pharmacy, or that starts at a retail clinic, or at the home. You know, you have a cough, you go look at Google. You, somewhere in the list you'll see, I've got throat cancer. It's like, you know, so that's, that's you know, but it's, it's a very, very small likelihood that that's gonna happen, but it's the professional or the doctor, your nurse tells you that that's not the case. And so you have to include them in this. Our job is to deliver 
a comprehensive diagnostic toolkit to clinicians so that they can make the best outcomes-based decisions possible for your health. So part of this toolkit involves creating a device that's very simple to use, but also gives results very fast and that are very reliable. What better way to do that than to bring the technology that you use every day into the clinic's office, right? So we take inspiration from things like cell phones or from consumer electronics to make these devices easy to use and robust and scalable. We humans are embracing technology to manage our health in new ways every day, both at home and in our doctor's office. But what role does technology play in the future of urine testing? So it's really the intention of medical device manufacturer uh, to make sure that we're using that innovation and that technological advance to really make sure that it's as easy as possible to perform quite complex testing sometimes. So that in terms of the interaction of the clinician with the device, it's just like using your smartphone. And the first bit of automation was automating the chemistry portion, that urine dipstick, um, where you, you can either manually dip it and put it on a reader that will then tie, do the appropriate timing and come up with the result, which is better than human eyes because that analyzer is, is reading the same color all the time. Um, and then we had the development of automation further where we just put the tube uh, of urine on the analyzer and it, the analyzer itself does the dipping and make sure, you know, so everything is standardized. Wonderful advancement. And that allows the laboratory scientists to go off and be doing other things. The instruments, they've come a really long way over the years. We have a lot of opportunity using camera systems and, and digitalization to better control really the environment that they're run in. Diagnostic devices are getting smaller. Space is at a premium in any lab area. Uh, there's a need to do more and have more testing capacity for more and more patients with more and more chronic conditions, but without necessarily keeping up with the addition of space and equipment uh, and the number of people. If you have a bigger system, you, have, you need more lab space, you need more bench space, um, which comes at a premium in hospitals and doctor's office. So by having this smaller system, we're able to go into more places and help more customers um, be, really, be really close to the patient rather than um, needing a special or additional um, touch points before we get the results. Our goal is not to make it any more complicated to use a medical device compared to using equipment like a, a phone or computer that we use every single day. I'm going to say recent as in 10 years as opposed to the last two, three, but certainly I think all of us carry a very powerful computer in our pockets. Some of us carry two or three of them, whether it's your Fitbits that, that tell you how well you're exercising, whether it's your sleep patterns, whether it's your breathing cycles, your, you know, everything that tells you a little bit more about not only your health, but what qualifies as being good, right, in terms of staying healthy. Consumerism has increased. You know, so our comfort level with technology and things has gotten to a much greater level. So there's also the expectation of tests and things like that to be a lot more, you know, usable. So that ease of use, that trend towards consumerism has to flow into the professional settings as well. So I think that's one very critical uh, aspect of it. And that, uh, you know, and that includes, you know, the, the training, for example. I, I, I don't think I've downloaded a single app that I've actually said, I, hey, I better read the instructions. So the original technology that was used to make machines to read urine strips was based very similarly off of digital cameras of today. But as much as digital cameras have evolved, so have our instruments, right? We're always looking for the next way to make the technology of today the technology of tomorrow. So we look at things like better cameras, better illumination, better timing, better user interfaces that can provide for it easier workflow for the customer. All of these things are being considered for the next generation of ear analysis analyzers. So the next generation may have an entire new suite of features that weren't there before because of all these new advances. The best thing about ear analysis is that it's very easy to get sample. It's very easy to test the sample. It's very easy to generate a bunch of data. I mean, think about a, a urine strip. A urine strip which has 10 parameters on it generates 10 data points every time it's used. We haven't reached the point where we are actually able to say, I've got 10 parameters that I'm tracking on a regular basis. What does all that information mean together? That amount of data that you generate from a simple thing as a urine test is actually huge. 
you know, because not only is the amount of it, but the ease at which you can generate it. You don't need a blood draw. I don't need to be pierced every poked every time I need I need to get a test done. Although your analysis has been, uh, you know, around for a long, long time, it doesn't mean that, you know, there isn't a tremendous amount of value in pulling it into the modern age, especially with the advent of, of you know, artificial intelligence or machine learning um, tools that actually make make a lot more sense of a lot of data that's generated. There's a whole big future out there in the medical world. I think there's so much more that we can do and to innovate in that, in that space. I do believe that there will be other future chemistries and biomarkers that we can put on to a strip um, in the future. So today we have chemistry like glucose, which really helps on the disease state of diabetes. Also, we're looking at chronic kidney disease. In the future, we might want to look at heart disease, things like that that impact our lives. We would take current biomarkers that are out there on other platforms and look at that chemistry and find a way to make that chemistry so we can put it down on a strip, much like the urinalysis chemistry is today. It's clear that technology can play a role in making urine testing even more intelligent. But what about the people behind the science? Is there a future in urine? We're always working on something here. Uh, my team works day in and day out on the products that we currently offer and the next generation of products that we intend to offer. One of the interesting things about he being here in Northern Indiana is that we're at really the mothership for your analysis. Uh, it all started here, right? But since 1956, the people working on these things haven't sat idle. We've been working on new formulations and constantly iterating on design to make sure that we're doing the right things with our products and delivering the best patient results. With all that experience and all of that history manufacturing these types of products, we know what quality is. For me personally, you know, I think there's a, there's a long way to go in terms of how much innovation there is in, in your analysis. And I think bringing, I've certainly worked a lot at not only understanding what that it is, but bringing other people along, especially people early in their career from different walks of life, different skill sets, different backgrounds, that have actually come on board, learned about it. So when I was studying uh, in the UK, you can probably tell that I, I don't come from uh, this part of uh, Indiana in the US. I was always really interested in uh, healthcare and medicine, but I had a business background. So I was really looking for uh, a way of, of pursuing an a exciting career and dynamic career, but in an industry where I could make a, a meaningful contribution in some way. Uh, so I found myself with the perfect combination of business, but also healthcare. Oh, I would highly recommend a, a career in the laboratory for those individuals that love biological science or science in general. One of the mothers in my junior year was a nurse, and she took her daughter, who was a friend of mine, and three other people to a tour in a hospital where she worked. And I saw the things that were going on in the laboratory, all the machinery and equipment and microscopes, and it was just so exciting. And really, from that day forward, then I knew what I was going to be. You know, you start college and they say, well, what's your major? laboratory science. They said, what program do you want to go into? And I said, um, what's the hardest? And they said, biochemistry. And that's how I became a biochemist. Being a woman in science, it's, it's, it certainly has had its challenges over the years. There, there are lots of times when I'm in a room, a conference room, a meeting, where I am still the only woman. I think we've made great breakthroughs. Helen Free is a great example of a woman scientist who back in the 1940s, you know, was innovative with her husband, Al Free, and creating urinalysis, right? Creating that first glucose dipstick. So I think women since then have made great strides, but I think we have a long way to go. I think a lot of people, especially girls, don't necessarily see themselves as scientists because they tend to think of science as something that's done just by mutant geniuses and not by normal people. It's really important to be at a place that, that really inspires um, and encourages kids to interact with with science and STEM um, in their day-to-day -day life in fun ways. Right now, we're, we're here at Ethos Innovation Center in Elkhart, uh, Indiana, and it's really significant because your analysis, the strips have been around for a long time, but what we're really trying to do is take our device and, and really innovate on it to enable things in the future um, and improve those, those clinician and patient experiences um, when they go to the doctor's office. 
being a part of a company that's the leader in, in your analysis, as we develop this next gen device for reading urine tests, it, it's been really important to make sure that we're able to keep that legacy going. I'm an engineer, right? So I deal with information. There's an amazing amount of information about your health in, in urine. You know, and I think being able to capture that information and do something with it is 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 absolutely you know one of the things I'm personally I'm very passionate about. In our Mishawaka facility, we actually have a board where people bring in pictures of their kids, uh, relatives who have benefited from by using our products and have their story um, up there on the board for everyone to see. I could send you working here as Siemens, health and ears, doing what I do, knowing that I am improving people's lives every day. I do know that it will impact my family one day, whether it's my wife, my kids, my grandkids, myself personally, my parents, my aunts, my uncles, just up the street. I know that they're gonna be tested with my strips. Working 41 years in the field of healthcare is really uh, and important for me. There's a lot of other things you can do in, in life, but in healthcare, you know everything you're doing is helping people. I've been in this uh, field for 34 years. I have a chemistry background. That's been my life, has been chemistry. So I ended up in the diagnostics field because I really wanted to impact the patient. My mission, and I consider this really personal and very important, is to take this legacy and carry it in my career. I intend to do well by this history and by these products because I think it makes a difference in the clinic and in people's lives. We deliver a lot of tests globally and have for many decades, and I don't have any intent on stopping. I have a little story to tell about my book. My mother and I were at an event af shortly after it published, and a friend of my mother's came up, and my mother was gushing, oh, um, my daughter wrote a book. And the woman turns to me and she says, oh, and what is the uh, title of the book? And I said, well, it's the fundamentals of urine and body fluid analysis. And her face just, her jaw just dropped. She looked at me. She turned around and walked away from my mother and I. It, it was just, it was embarrassing. She was embarrassed by the word urine. Laboratory scientists, we eat lunch every day and we talk a lot about body fluids. Urine is something we all excrete. We're all equal worldwide, everybody. We're all urine producers. And urine is, you know, like gold because it can tell a lot about what's going on in our body. So it is so important uh, to be proactive. Ask your doctor, give me a year analysis. I just want a baseline. Just tell me everything's okay. Urine is always going to be with us. <laughs> uh, it's been uh, tested for as many, many years, and it will continue to have a place in the healthcare uh, diagnostic field. Everybody pees, but now we know just how much information we can get from each and every sample. Who knew that anthills, clay tablets, early clinicians tasting urine, and two young scientists could all have such a great impact on human health? All the information it generates is crazy. I think, very true. There's still discovering things to look for, too. Right? Yeah, well, I was going to ask you that, John. So obviously, we've talked in the past about potential new tests, right? I mean, you know, is there more in the urine than we currently know about? So obviously, we look for the, let's say, 10, 12 common parameters or analytes that you look for in a sample, but we, we could well discover more uh, novel biomarkers for whatever disease, right? Potentially, yeah, right? Yeah. There's always people looking for things like that. Things will come across my desk all the time. You know, you wonder, is it worth taking a look at? It's our job. <laughs>